Hi everyone. Today I'd like to take a look at an Origipop song that was first written in 1927, but which is still fairly well known today. It's a song that has charted multiple times, even once in 1982, 55 years after it was first written. And this song has been used multiple times in film and on television. The song in question is Putting on the Ritz. Putting on the Ritz was written by one of the most famous Origipop composers, Irving Berlin, in 1927. But while he initially wrote it in 1927, it wasn't actually published until 1929. Before that, he had simply registered it as an unpublished song in 1927, and then again in 1928, before actually publishing it on December 2nd, 1929. There's not a lot of information on why he sat on this song for a couple of years before publishing it. Perhaps he was just waiting for a good setting in which to release it? Whatever the reason, an opportunity did eventually present itself as Berlin left New York to head west to Hollywood to try his hand at the newly developed musical picture. While Berlin had not written any songs specifically for a film before, his work was not entirely unknown in motion pictures. In fact, one of the very first songs to ever be heard on film was an Irving Berlin song from a few years previous. The film that is generally considered to be the very first talking picture was The Jazz Singer, released in 1927. And in that film can be heard Irving Berlin's 1926 song, Blue Skies. Blue skies, smiling at me, nothing but Anyways, by late 1929, Irving Berlin had headed out to Hollywood and was using his previously unpublished Puttin' on the Ritz, as well as a few other songs, for a brand new picture, appropriately titled Puttin' on the Ritz. This film, released on March 1st, 1930, was somewhat well received at the time, but is considered nowadays pretty subpar, featuring wooden acting, a silly plot, and primitive cinematography and editing. But the songs were generally well received, and none more so than the title song. The musical number of Putting on the Ritz in the film, while being a bit limited and static due to the technological restrictions of the time, is considered the high point of the film, and was the first musical number in film to feature both African American and white performers on stage at the same time. <laughs> But it was the song itself that was the only real successful takeaway from this film, becoming one of the most popular songs of 1930. But the film was not actually the first place this song would have been heard. In a bit of marketing synergy similar to today's multi-platform releases, Putting on the Ritz was published first as sheet music in December 1929, then released by multiple record labels, each featuring different performers, starting in January of 1930, then finally heard in the film, released on March 1st of 1930. One of the most popular of the records released featured vocals by the star of the film, Harry Richman, and music by Earl Burtnett and his Los Angeles Biltmore Hotel Orchestra. If you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where Harlem sits, putting on the ribs. This record, released on January 30th, 1930 by Brunswick Records, eventually became the number one selling record in America in 1930. However, it was not actually the first recording of this song. That honor actually goes to a version of the song performed by Leo Reisman and his orchestra with vocals by Lou Conrad and released on January 20th, 1930 by Victor Records. And another very successful version of this song released that year was an arrangement featuring vocals by Fred Astaire, released in May of 1930 by Columbia Records. This version also features actual dancing by Fred Astaire, as can be heard here. <laughs> the Ritz continued to be fairly popular throughout the 30s and can even be heard in the background of a few films before making its next big film appearance in the 1939 film Idiot's Delight, where it is sung and danced to by Clark Gable in his only singing role. Although he practiced the short musical number for six weeks, it wasn't terribly well received and he never performed a musical number again. 
The song was next heard on film in a much more well-received musical number. 1946's Blue Skies was based on a story by Irving Berlin and starred Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire, reprising their pairing from 1942's Holiday Inn. Also, as in Holiday Inn, Blue Skies was designed to showcase Irving Berlin's songs. And one of these songs that got quite a showcase was Putting on the Ritz. The musical number of this song is one of the high points of Blue Skies and is one of its most remembered scenes. It is shown in the film as a musical number put on by Astaire's character in a show. He starts by singing the lyrics, including the introductory verse, with only minimal dancing, and then he moves into a slow motion style of dancing before picking up speed and dancing around the room, utilizing his cane ingeniously. He then ends the number by dancing with nine other Fred Astaire's in a spectacular scene. Now, the lyrics Fred Astaire sings in this film are not actually the same lyrics used in any of the earlier versions, including the 1930 Fred Astaire version. The reason for that is because the original lyrics are actually pretty racist, and by this time they felt that it would be unacceptable to use such language in a major film. So, let's take a look at the lyrics and discuss what was inappropriate about them and how they were changed. But before we do, let's quickly look at the structure of the song and the music itself. And the version we'll be looking at will be the music as originally published in 1929, but with the later lyrics that I've edited into it. Here again, we see one of the most common Pop song formats of this era. The song has an 8-bar piano intro, followed by a 2-bar vamp, and then a 16-bar introductory verse. In this song, however, unlike many other songs from this time, the introductory verse is actually fairly well known and often heard, as in Blue Skies. It's a nice verse that I think complements the chorus very well, but its relationship with the chorus is interesting and a bit unusual in that it is in F major, and then the chorus is in F minor. So, while the first note of the chorus is F, the tonic note for both the verse and the chorus, we're now in the key of F minor, so the chorus ends up having a different feel than what we heard in the verse and what we're expecting. Now, the chorus follows the very common 32 bar or AABA form, and despite being in a different key, it actually musically is pretty standard. But the thing that makes this song sound really unique is its rhythm. There's a good quote that sums this up well by John Mueller, an American political scientist in the field of international relations, but who moonlights, I guess, as an expert in dance. You know, like you do. He said that the central device in the A section is the use of a delayed rhythmic resolution. A staggering off-balance passage emphasized by the unorthodox stresses in the lyric suddenly resolves satisfyingly on a held note, followed by the forceful assertion of the title phrase. Now, let's take a closer look at what's actually happening with the rhythm here. See, the A section of the chorus is made up mostly of a repeating four-note pattern. F, A flat, C, and then the C an octave lower. This cycle of four notes starts, as is common, with the first note on the downbeat, the first beat of the measure. But because the fourth note of the pattern, this low C, is only an eighth note and half the time of the other notes, now the first note of our pattern, the F, instead of being on the downbeat as it was the first time, is now a half beat ahead of what we expect. And then that's followed by an eighth note A flat, but a quarter note low C this time, further moving us back. Now the first note of our pattern, the third time through, is an entire beat ahead. And then the first two versions of that four note pattern just repeat, moving everything back again until it's two beats back. It is a complex form of syncopation that explains why Alec Wilder, author of the definitive book American Popular Song, The Great Innovators, 1900 and 1950, stated the rhythmic pattern in Putting on the Ritz is the most complex and provocative I have ever come upon. This 8-bar A section repeats twice, then is followed by a much more normal, barely syncopated rhythm in the B section, or bridge, which serves as a contrast to the previous rhythmic complexities. Then we hear the music of the A section once more before the song either repeats or ends. Now, let's return to the subject of the lyrics. To put on the Ritz was a slang term at the time which meant to dress fashionably. The phrase referred to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, a high-end luxury hotel in New York. And in the original lyrics, those people dressing fashionably were African Americans. In that first version of the song, it essentially talks about going down and watching the poor black people from Harlem dressing up all fancier than they should and spending all their money. Let's go through the lyrics and discuss what's happening. We'll start with the introductory verse. Have you seen the well-to-do up on Lenox Avenue? Lenox Avenue was a main route in Harlem, a predominantly black neighborhood of New York. On that famous thoroughfare with their noses in the air. So, these black people from Harlem are acting fancy or snobbish, perhaps even that they're better than other people. High hats and colored collars, white spats and fifteen dollars. 
I'm not actually sure about the significance of the term colored collars. It obviously has something to do with fancy clothes, but since it was a term that was changed for the later versions, it's possible it had a racial connotation that I'm unaware of. And it seems that $15 was probably about the weekly wage of African American men in the 1930s. And according to the next line, they were spending every dime for a wonderful time. So the black people get all dressed up, act fancy, and go spend all their money. Then in the chorus, if you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where Harlem sits, putting on the Ritz. So now the song starts talking about going and watching these black people dress up and try to act fancy as a form of entertainment if you're feeling down. Spangled gowns upon a bevy of high browns from down the levee, all misfits, putting on the Ritz. The term high browns referred to someone of mixed racial background and lighter skin, possibly even with the inference that they were putting on airs beyond their social station. And they follow this up by calling them all misfits. Ugh. In the bridge it continues, That's where each and every Lulu Bell goes, Every Thursday evening with her swell bows, Rubbing elbows. This is tricky. I've heard that Lulu Bell was a generic nickname for a black maid, and Thursday evening was typically the maid's night off, but I haven't been able to verify the former fact, although I have the latter. Alternatively, Lulu Bell was also the name of a popular 1926 musical in which the title character, a black female nightclub performer, gets ahead through affairs with various men. As a result of this musical, the term Lulu Bell became shorthand for social climbing black women, overly preoccupied with fashion. This play also facilitated white fascination with Harlem and is responsible for sending whites scurrying in droves to experience authentic Harlem nightclubs, which is exactly what this first version of Putting on the Ritz is all about. Anyways, the song continues with the last A section. Come with me and we'll attend their jubilee and see them spend their last two bits putting on the Ritz. And here at the end of the chorus, it again mentions that an entertaining thing to do is go watch these poor black people spend all their money trying to dress and act fancy. Obviously, these lyrics and the overall sentiment of the song are really racist and problematic. So, when they included the song in Blue Skies in 1946, the social circumstances had apparently changed enough that Irving Berlin rewrote the words and changed the entire focus of the song. It was still obviously about putting on the Ritz, dressing fancy, but now it's poking fun at wealthy white people. I won't go through all of the lyrics again, but some of the changes include Park Avenue for Lenox Avenue and Arrow Collars for Colored Collars. Arrow was a brand of shirt and detachable shirt collars popular at the time. $15 became lots of dollars to again show that the subject of the song had changed to much wealthier people. In the first A section, the word Harlem was changed to fashion, but most of the changes occur after this. In fact, the rest of the song is almost entirely different, making reference to different types of coats, striped pants, and Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper was a very popular and handsome actor from this period. And at the end, there's a mention of Rockefellers, which of course refers to the incredibly wealthy Rockefeller family. So, those are the updated lyrics. Now, there are a few other lyrics you might see, like a very obscure second introductory verse only found on a few versions of the original sheet music. And this couplet, found in this Irving Berlin songbook, the origin of which I'm somewhat unsure of. They were definitely written by Irving Berlin, I'm just not sure when or why. Regardless, these aren't often heard, and the 1946 updated lyrics we've discussed are the lyrics that have been heard with this song for almost all of the subsequent versions, whether heard on film, television, or modern covers. Now, let's discuss some of these subsequent versions. After Blue Skies, the song can be heard in the background of 1954's There's No Business Like Show Business, another musical featuring all Irving Berlin songs, and in several TV shows here and there, like the Jack Benny program and the Danny Kaye show. But one of the most prominent appearances of this song, and one that is still well known to modern audiences, is in the 1974 Mel Brooks comedy, Young Frankenstein. In this film, the song is sung by Gene Wilder's character, Dr. Frankenstein, and the monster he has created, played by Peter Boyle, as an attempt by Dr. Frankenstein to persuade other scientists that he has created a sophisticated and intelligent creature. And despite the monster's hilarious rendition of the title phrase, it goes well, until a footlight on the stage explodes and startles him, ruining the performance. If you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where fashion sits? Interestingly, Mel Brooks did not actually want to do this scene. Gene Wilder and Mel Brooks wrote the script together, and this scene was actually Gene Wilder's idea. Mel Brooks, in the audio commentary for the film, said that he thought the scene was too crazy and much too unreal, and he didn't think it would work. But he said that Gene Wilder understood this idea of where science meets showbiz, and that's why we have this scene. And it worked. 
It really did. The scene is hilarious and one of the most well-remembered from this movie, and it probably helped to introduce or at least reintroduce this song to audiences of the 1970s. And it wasn't too long after this that this song would again get new life breathed into it and be introduced to a new generation yet again. In 1982, Indonesian Dutch singer Taco released a synth pop cover of Putting on the Ritz, which became a huge hit. This version was released in the US in 1983 and was accompanied by a music video which was played regularly on MTV. Despite the very different style and sound of this arrangement, it is actually fairly faithful to the original in a lot of ways. He sings the updated lyrics from 1946 and sings the chorus, verse, and then chorus again straight through, and after this even includes a tap dance interlude, perhaps as an homage to Fred Astaire. At the end, he also references a few other Irving Berlin songs, such as Always, White Christmas, Alexander's Ragtime Band, and There's No Business Like Show Business. He also references Broadway Rhythm for some reason, which was not written by Irving Berlin, but instead by Nazio Herb Brown and Arthur Freed and Heard in Singing in the Rain. Unfortunately, Taco's original music video continued the song's racist legacy by featuring white characters in blackface. Subsequently, these characters were mostly edited out, but you can still just glimpse them in the background. But overall, this version was very popular, entering into the top 10 on the charts in numerous countries, including the US. As a result of this, Irving Berlin, then 95 years old, became the oldest ever living songwriter to have one of his compositions enter the top 10. As for why he picked this song, Taco, in an interview, said that after making songs in Germany for a few years, he wanted to get away from the German pop image. And so, I had to come up with a radical new image. And with the new electro-pop movement, I combined the American songbook with new wave beats. And again, it worked. This song once more became a cultural phenomenon. And in addition to the public success, apparently even the song's composer, Irving Berlin, liked it. Taco said that he had the opportunity to speak to Mr. Berlin on the phone, and he told me how much he liked our version of his song. After this successful reimagining, Putting on the Ritz continued to be heard in numerous films and on television, although usually in its more traditional style. And there have been covers by other artists as well since then, such as a recent version by Betty Boom and Jay Fitz, which my daughter actually just did a tap dance recital to. One of my favorite appearances in television is in the British comedy Jeeves and Worcester. This program, based on the Jeeves stories of P.G. Woodhouse, featured many great original pop songs, usually sung and played on the piano by Hugh Laurie, as one of the title characters, Bertie Worcester. Interestingly, this version combines the different lyrics, starting with the original lyrics in the introductory verse, and then moving to the 1946 lyrics in the chorus. There is also another set of lyrics that are more uncommon in the second A section. I also like this scene because it portrays Worcester having difficulty with the rhythm of the piece, which I think is funny and a clever nod to the song's unusual rhythm. However, a pianist as skilled as he is probably shouldn't have any trouble with it, and despite what Jeeves says, it is not in a 5-4 time signature. But it's still funny. Here's the clip. If you're blue and you don't know where to go to If you're blue and you don't know where to If you're blue and you don't know where to go to this Irving Berlin fellow seems to have come a bit of a cropper here, Jeeves. Sir? This new song of his, too many words, not enough notes. If you'll pardon me for saying so, sir, it seems to be a reasonably straightforward, syncopated 5-4 time signature. If you were to accent the words if, where, and fashion, I think you'll find that the correct rhythmic pattern would emerge. If, where, and fashion. <clears throat> if you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where fashion sits? On the Ritz. Anyways, this song is well-known and iconic and has, through years of various versions, arrangements, and film and television appearances, entered into our collective cultural consciousness in a way that few original pop songs have. It has an unusual and unique sound that sets it apart from many other songs of this era, and is probably one of the main reasons this song continues to be revisited and reused through various mediums. And despite its problematic original lyrics, it has since been rewritten and reworked, which allows us and future generations to continue to enjoy this timeless piece of original popular music. Thanks for watching. Well, just as well for him, he chose the Ritz Jeeves. Imagine the trouble he'd have got into if he decided to write about uh, putting on the Regency. I mean, where do you suppose he'd find a rhyme for Regency, Jeeves? Uh, with due expediency, sir? With due expediency. Putting on the Regency doesn't really work, does it, Jeeves? Very true, sir. 